This man has a remarkable story to tell. He claims to have infiltrated a secret world and collected information about the appalling activities of British criminals living in Amsterdam. This was done by people who knew people who wanted to harm children. This was done as a money-making venture. It was also done by very highly organized criminals. The allegations in this program may seem beyond belief that British men living in Amsterdam have been making money from sex crimes for which children have paid with their lives. I can remember that each face separately. I can remember them in detail. What age were they? What were their appearances? They were all aged between 9 and 10, 11 at the very oldest. Uh, they were all very thin, uh, very young boys. Tonight, for the first time, Edward describes how he stumbled into a terrible hidden world where young children are abused and then murdered, all before the unblinking eye of the video camera. The police say they've never seen a genuine tape where a child is actually killed. Surely it's more likely that this was a clever fake. No, it's, a, it's not a clever fake. These tapes do exist. The, the problem is that it is so hard for, for people like you and I to believe that there are people out there that would do that to children, that it is easier for us to dismiss it as being a fable. Um, in the Second World War, people didn't believe that there were concentration camps, uh, and there were. Uh, it, it is easier to believe that I'm lying than to believe that these tapes are real. No police force in the world has ever seen a genuine so-called snuff movie where a child is actually killed in front of the camera. But tapes have been seized where children are terribly abused. In this case, the victim was an eight-year-old boy called Bjorn. The Swedish police released extracts from one tape to Swedish television, who passed them to us. In Britain, what was the Obscene Publication Squad is now reorganized as the paedophilia unit. Fifteen officers work full-time trying to catch the paedophiles and identify their victims. Thousands of tapes are laboriously examined, since paedophiles will often hide obscene material on apparently innocent recordings. Thankfully, most people have never seen what's referred to as child pornography. And I think if you ask them the question what child pornography is, they conjure up in their mind the, the image that they can deal with on a personal level. What we actually deal with here, which is unfortunately often referred to as kiddie porn, is the evidence of serious sexual crimes against children. And that evidence is contained in the films, whether it be on video or photograph. The paedophilia unit at Scotland Yard has also seized a copy of the Bjorn tape. Their interest is in the English men who made the tape and the young boy they abuse. And it shows a young boy aged between seven and eight years carried into a room. He's hooded. He's taken to a chair or he's tied to the chair. And then over a period of time, he is sexually abused in the most horrific way. The police believe the man is from the south of England and is called John. The boy is European but speaks English. At one point he warns John not to show his face. The boy shouts your face, which tends to, uh, to show that he's either been told that there, there's obviously a monster in front of him where he can see what's happening, um, and he's been told that if at any stage the abuser's face is on there, he, he is to say. 
The paedophilia unit has asked us to show this picture from the Bjorn tape to help them identify the English man, John. When some of them say that, that they love children, and, and when you see this type of film, there's no way they can say they love children. Why not? Because the, the terror that is in this child's face and, and the fear that is there to actually drug a child, to actually wake him up, hear him scream when, when he is buggered, there's, there is no way that uh, he can say that child is enjoying it. This man says he has seen five tapes where children have not only been sexually abused, they've also been tortured and then killed in front of the camera. So five different men yes. killed children on these tapes. Yes, five different And allowed men. themselves to be videotaped doing so. Yes. That, that really does strain the bounds of credibility, doesn't it? The, the people who wanted these tapes to be made were people who wanted to kill children. They wanted the memory of it. They wanted to see it in person. They wanted to do it. And they wanted something to remember it by. The problem with this claim is that no one has yet found any physical evidence to prove that murders have been committed on videotape. We've recovered a number of videotapes which, which feature the horrendous abuse of children, uh, including torture. Thankfully, no law enforcement officer anywhere in the world has ever found what is known as a snuff video. Does that mean they don't exist? We don't know. Having said that, the, the characteristics of some of these offenders might suggest that they're capable of this, particularly the, the offender with sadistic tendencies. In the late 1980s, when he was 22, Edward moved from Birmingham to Amsterdam to take advantage of its more liberal attitudes towards homosexuality. Edward insists he is not a paedophile, but burdened by the horrors he has witnessed, he's decided to speak out publicly for the first time about the hidden world of perversion and murder he discovered. The other thing that many people might think, because this is so difficult to comprehend, is that you've simply fantasized this, that this is the product of your imagination. It's a very warped imagination for somebody to dream something like this up. People sometimes have warped imagination. Not when you consider the people that I'm actually describing. Edward met British paedophiles of every description in Amsterdam. The most alarming figure was Warwick Spinks, who's currently coming to the end of a five-year jail sentence in England for the rape and abduction of a 14-year-old boy. Warwick Spinks was a very, very plausible individual, a man who gave off an impression of being wealthy. He actually was able to speak many languages. Being travelling extensively, he was able to meet people, talk about his meetings with people. Uh, some say he was, had a magnetic character. He was very loud, brash, is another description. But underneath, he's very dangerous. Edward is a former friend of Warwick Spinks. Edward says he's finally decided to tell his story because he cannot forget one apparently simple incident in the centre of Amsterdam when he met Spinks and a young boy. He turned up one day with a, a boy gripped very tightly by the arm. And the boy was only about eight, seven or eight. Uh, typical a uh, Dutch-looking boy, uh, blonde hair and blue eyes, uh, and, and the boy looked absolutely terrified. What did Warwick say to you? Uh, he glanced down at the boy and said, uh, I've got a delivery, I'm going to be another half an hour. I, I don't know what happened to the boy. Um, I never saw the boy again, um, and decided not to ask Warwick what he actually meant by making a delivery. He was very adept at uh, identifying vulnerable children. He would visit railway stations, uh, streets in London, and having identified a child, he would then convince the child that uh, it was in his interests to know him. He would also uh, eventually sexually abuse them. But on that basis, he would always have at the back of his mind, I suspect, that uh, there was an opportunity to take the child to Amsterdam. 
When Edward Metzpinks, the friendly Londoner, was working as a barman and pimp in a brothel called the Gay Place. Upstairs was uh, a gay brothel um, for prostitutes, uh, male prostitutes. Uh, Warwick's job there was basically to pimp for the prostitutes upstairs and also, of course, to encourage uh, other prostitutes to join. In Holland, prostitution, gay or straight, is tolerated and open. Boys under the age of 16 are not allowed to work in brothels, but paedophiles who want to have sex with much younger children can find what they want in Amsterdam. Men like Warwick Spinks need a steady supply of vulnerable young boys. Many of the youngsters who end up trapped in Amsterdam start their journey on the streets of London. This is Piccadilly Circus. This is what's called the meat racket. A lot of people know that if you want a male prostitute, this is where you'll come for one. So why didn't you go straight there and then straight home again? I didn't know I was not allowed to walk around. I'm sorry. We well, can walk around, but when you start loitering in toilets and looking at people, um, then you start um, getting people's the reason we stopped you is... The police estimate that there are at least 25,000 paedophiles currently active in Britain. Sergeant Steve Edwards and his colleagues stop and question any young person they suspect may be at risk of attracting the attention of paedophiles. We've got some information that there may be a man bringing uh, young boys up from the south coast. This is the station that feeds the south coast, so we may see him wandering about with boys. Also, because it's a mainline station, you'll get runaways coming in. The first port calls always going to be a British Rail mainline station before they go anywhere else. So if we can get them before they get too far. It's, it's fast food outlets here as well. We might get people hanging around. There's also a couple of amusement arcades. Amusement arcades are irresistible magnets for many children and for the men who hunt them. If a kid's only got four or five pounds in their pocket, the money's going to go really quickly. And what you'll find at the back of these amusement arcades is adult males with pockets full of pound coins. And when the kids run out of money, they'll say, have a couple of pounds. Would you like to go for a coffee? Would you like to have a burger with me? Did you know, before I was standing there, was you aware of the man that was standing behind you, watching you? Yeah. Do you know what a paedophile is? Yeah. There's a lot of them about. And what this geezer was doing, he was looking at you. This young boy was given a severe warning and taken home to his parents. Men like Warwick Spinks are expert at targeting and exploiting vulnerable young people they meet on the street. He would go to London or Munich or Berlin uh, so he was able to approach the boys and offer them something that they needed at the time, uh, whether that was just a roof over their head um, or security or money or drugs or just two meals a day. In November 1992, 17-year-old Kenny was homeless, penniless, and drifting into drugs. He was the perfect target for Warwick Spinks. I didn't have much friends at the time, and he seemed okay, he seemed genuine. I didn't know that Warwick was gay until the, the following night, when we was in the pubs and the clubs, and until I saw Warwick, the way he worked, the way he was uh, getting on with people. Binks persuaded 17-year-old Kenny to travel with him to a private gay club in Amsterdam. He then got a book out, showing young boys. They passed it to me. I felt... I felt terrified. I didn't know what the next question was going to be. When... when he showed me the book, he was enjoying it. It wasn't just about money. I mean, he got kicks from it. He loved it. It showed, I would say, about 15 to 20 photographs of young boys between 9 and 13. That's com completely naked, like showing their penis off, 
and everything on their body. Some of them wasn't smiling. Some of them looked I don't know, scared. Some of them looked drugged up. Some of them looked happy, happy as they wanted to, to do what they were doing. But most of the photographs, I saw that they did not want to do it. And that's what gave me the bad vibe. Did it say anything with any of the photographs? Yeah, there was um, a photograph, and it says a virgin. And that's the only thing that actually said. It was the only photograph that actually said it. And what age would that boy have been? I think he'd be about 10, 11. He was only a child. Kenny ended up owing Spinks hundreds of pounds. When he couldn't pay up, Spinks suggested an alternative method of clearing his debt. He says the only way you can pay it off is to get young boys. And what he meant, and what I totally understood, is he more wanted young male boys to, to go with him and, and make sexual films. I, I told him no. I told him that is just out of the question. I'd pay him in installments if he likes it or not. Um, Warwick started to get violent. Not fighting violent, but sexually violent. Pushing me around. He was laughing. He enjoyed it. Kenny says Spinks raped him that night. Spinks also told the teenager why he wanted younger boys. I says, what do you get out of it? And he says, he likes him to bleed. He likes him to cry. He likes, he likes to see pain. He, he gets orgasms over the pain. And, I mean, that's what he does. He just, he just enjoys it. He says to me, he likes the boys to cry. He enjoys the boys to cry. He wants the boys to cry. And, he goes out to make them cry, and that's, I think that's his hit, that's his ambition, that's what he wants. Kenny refused to help Spinks find younger boys, and managed to break away from the sinister world into which he had stumbled. Others weren't so lucky. Edward says that he didn't realise Spinks was both a paedophile and a pimp, until it was too late. Uh, people would uh, approach him, being the sort of character he was, and uh, say that they wanted to have sex with uh, boys who were younger uh, than were allowed in the brothels, or to have uh, rough sex, or um, extremely um, dangerous sex uh, with underage children. The challenge for Spinks was to find a steady supply of underage boys to feed the appetites of his clients in Amsterdam. The Londoner had his favourite hunting grounds. One was Piccadilly Circus. A lot of people know that if you want a male prostitute, this is where you'll come for one. They'll, they'll sit in the front windows of the fast foods or the, the coffee shops, hang around on the railings, and it's punters that want a young man will come here. Listen to me. Right? Sergeant Steve Edwards is constantly on the lookout for young homeless boys who often end up selling themselves as prostitutes. They're known on the street as rent boys. I think it's been explained to you. Oh, I said to you earlier on, oh, now I have more evidence that you are renting, all right, because you've got, you're renting. Look at this. Yeah? Warwick Spinks would prey on children that were vulnerable in their own life, that needed things that they didn't have, things that they perceive can be offered by people like Warwick Spinks. And particularly bearing in mind he would travel to the areas where vulnerable children would tend to congregate, whether it be runaways from home, strangers to particularly London, he would know that they were there particularly because they were vulnerable. Spink's next victim, Gary, was just 14 years old. He and a friend had run away from a children's home in the north of England and were living on the street in London when they first met Warwick Spinks. 
a living room for, for about a night, two nights or something like that. Shabby, it was cold, we had nothing to eat, we were sat on a wall. When um, Warwick approached us, we were only 14. We, we just thought he was a genuine guy, so we thought, right, we might be able to get a bed for night, something to eat, some grub was starving, but no to eat and no money. So we went down with him. The boys travelled with Spinks to his flat in Hastings. And then he pulled out a knife and then told us to take our clothes off and form sexual acts with each other. And I do stuff while I took pictures and then he sexually abused us both. Why was he taking the pictures? Peter Fowler and I, he was sending it to Amsterdam and his different little places so he could, so he could make money. Hooked on drugs and totally under Spink's control, the 14-year-old was taken on a terrifying journey to a strange city. I didn't know what to do, so then he said, we're going to Amsterdam to go and pick up some drugs. So I went across with him, and then he, he sort of sold me onto a brothel. Gary says he was sold by Spinks at the Blue Boy, a notorious gay brothel in the heart of Amsterdam. And what happened to you then? I got sexually abused by all, all, all the punters, all the landlord. They used to just give the boys drugs, to give, give, give me drugs, so you zombies, even if you didn't want drugs, to give you them anyway. Put them in your drinks, and you couldn't move, and then people could do what they wanted to you. Amsterdam takes pride in its reputation as Europe's most tolerant city. Claims that children have been killed on camera in Amsterdam take child pornography to the extreme. But all kinds of British men who are sexually attracted to children, and the criminals who profit from this obsession, have congregated here. There have been long-held suspicions that boys were being encouraged to leave London and travel to Amsterdam to work in the, in the brothels that existed there. This was in the time of about 1990, 1991. Uh, a number of information sources approached us, telling us that this was happening and that it involved United Kingdom nationals. This is the Dutch home of Englishman Peter Howells. Mr Howells is an actor and the manager of a London-based casting agency called Bother Boots. For nearly 20 years, the agency was used as a cover for another area of the child pornography business, obscene photographs. Children were tempted to pose for bother boots by the offer of TV work. This reconstruction is based on statements given by children to the police. Children as young as eight would visit the home of a man who they thought was the official photographer for bother boots. Hello, lad. How do you come? Come on in. Harry Jeffries always welcomed young boys, like Lee. Harry was coming across like he was like an uncle. Everything that we was doing was basically, he was letting us do that we couldn't really do during school times anywhere else. I'd done a photo session at his flat, and he told me he would take me home to my doorstep and tell my mum why I was a bit late. He actually come to my front door, um, explained who he was to my mum, um, and told her that I was late because of a football match. Um, and he was there as a spectator, as a friend of mine, and he brought me home, and he, my mum had nothing to worry about. Eleven. Yeah, he must have been. Although he, he always looked younger than what he was, like right little baby fuss. And I didn't give it any thought. And then I, I met Harry again. This time I happened to be in hospital. And Lee came up to see me and Harry was with him. And not long, it must be about a year, maybe a year. I'd just lost my husband. And uh, I got cold and Harry put his coat around me. Kathy was one of many parents whose children visited Jeffrey's flat. None of them had any reason to think that Uncle Harry and his friends posed any danger. 
with paedophiles, there's this mistaken belief that the indecency offences that take place or may take place afterwards follow immediately. That certainly isn't the case. Paedophiles are quite happy to spend a considerable amount of time and money to befriend the whole family and to befriend the child. And they can, this can take several years before actually anything happens. After winning the parents' confidence, Uncle Harry would ask the children to make further unaccompanied visits for private picture sessions. How do you like to do some television? Eh? The children were impressed by the fact that one of the other photographers, James Chalkley, already had a minor role in the TV soap EastEnders. I thought it was a good opportunity for me to really get onto EastEnders through doing photos. So I basically thought it was innocent through wearing swimming trunks as well, that there was nothing wrong with doing it. But, but then it got to the stage where he would say, can you pull the trunks down from your bum a little bit and just expose a little? Well, that's when I started to actually worry a bit. What the photographers, and certainly Harry and the others did, was they would say, right, we need to rub baby oil on you because it enhances the, the picture that we're taking. So initially the boys would actually rub baby oil on themselves and then you would get, you've missed a bit. And so the photographers themselves would then rub it further and they would then start asking them to roll down their pants until it virtually became nothing that they were wearing. Take them off. I'm not going to ask again. Stand up. He would get more aggressive in the way he talked to you and... If he was to say to you, are you ready to do photos? And you say, no, I'm not doing no photos no more. I'm at a certain age. I was 14. I said, I've had enough now. No more photos. He'd get to the stage where he would physically, verbally say to you, like, if you don't do these photos, your mum and dad will know about these. Everyone will know about these. I'll put these everywhere. First of all, your parents won't believe you if you tell them I photographed you naked. Secondly, I will show these photographs around the estate to all your friends and they're going to laugh at you. I was just so young and so scared that I, I just, I didn't have it in me. I just couldn't do it. I could not tell my mum or dad what was going on. Even though, as much as I really wanted to tell them, I just couldn't do it. It would have been very easy to frighten me like that. It would have worried him as well. It makes you feel like you want to tear, tear your hair out. Because I know how frightened Lee could be. And the thought of what he must have gone through there or what was being done to him and knowing how scared he must have been it just oh it just does me up inside badly it really does to know that they could have got him in that sort of position to be that frightened and that scared that he couldn't even tell me matter with you you little puff I don't even think of telling your mum. So, um, let's uh, have your T-shirt off, eh? Let's see what you look like. Harry Jeffries succeeded in terrorising the children into silence about the fact that he was making them pose for indecent photographs. The truth about Harry only emerged because one young boy went to the police. Matthew was nine years old when he was first photographed by Harry Jeffries. They call you a little puff or you're nothing, all the rest of it. Like, I won't get you any more film work or I'll show the photos I've got you on the estate, no one will talk to you, all that sort of thing. It'd always be saying evil at the back of his mind. In the living room, there was a hole not through to his bedroom. And they could take pictures through there or just watch people through there. Just like all the hidden air vents false walls put up and behind the walls they'd just be a cupboard for the camera equipment, negatives, everything else. It ain't just a case of getting a kid doing this, doing that. It's well thought of. It's what people don't understand. They think it's just one of the things people do, but it ain't. They actually sat down and thought about it before they do it. That's the sickening part of it. After five years of abuse, Matthew broke the wall of silence by going to the police. Other children then came forward with similar stories. Finally, the police raided Harry Jeffrey's home. Hidden everywhere throughout the flat, from places as strange as the fridge, salt pots, behind pictures, cornflake packets. 
basically you name any place you can hide something, hid, hidden, negatives, photographs, and everything. We literally recovered hundreds upon hundreds of photographs and negatives. I went to see one of the mothers because I suspected that some of the photographs I had were of her son. It was a knock at the door and I opened it. And there was a policewoman standing there and a guy in plain clothes. They told me they were. I can say that it was one of the most difficult interviews I've had to deal with because you're not only dealing with a mother whose son has been photographed and she was unaware of this, I couldn't look at my brother, I couldn't even look at my mum, I couldn't go near anyone. I just felt like so dirty and, and I felt like scum, to be honest, because I just couldn't believe that everything had just come out. And then Ian turned around and said, I'm sorry Lisa, I've got photos. And Molly just broke down. Uh, he, he couldn't talk for a little while. I couldn't talk for a little while. The photographs are extremely explicit, specifically to display their genital area. And for them to have to look at those, I personally couldn't look at photographs of that type of me again. And I have to say that for some of them, they were unable to look at those photographs. I just felt so ashamed inside. I just didn't know what to do. I just broke down and cried. Harry Jeffries was convicted and served one year of a two-year sentence for taking indecent photographs. He's now back living behind closed doors. In a secretly recorded conversation, Jeffries still denies any wrongdoing. You know how we are dealt with. Well, pick it up. Look, I'm an artist, right? I take new photographs. Don't you realize what I've been through? And yet you come here and you stir it all up. Harry Jeffries refused our request for an interview. When we returned to his home, we found Mr. Jeffries and another man once again in the company of a young boy. Yep. How many children's lives have you ruined, Mr. Jeffries? Answer the question, please. Mr. Jeffries, why won't you answer the question? We've seen you with a young boy today. What were you doing with him, Mr. Jeffries? The boy let slip that Jeffries was once again up to his old tricks. Was he taking indecent photographs? Jumping. No, we don't take a photograph that's fine. The police have now started a new investigation of Harry Jeffries. Take your T-shirt off. Let's have a look at you. Every single night of my life, it's always there. I can still dream there and see Harry in my nightmares and wake up. I mean, I have cold sweats still 10 years on to what happens. Um, I wake up cold, cold sweats and everything where I just think back of everything that we've gone through. And, and, and it's just, it's just a nightmare. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And I just wish I could tell about the clock. Harry Jeffries told his victims he was an official photographer for Bother Boots, a casting agency. The owner of Bother Boots is Peter Howells. I'd never leave any kid in the room with him there. I was about 10 or 11 and Howells must have been in his 40s, at least in his 40s by then. And there was a night when Peter Howells tried putting his arm around me in, into my pyjama bottoms. And when I sort of like pushed him away and told Harry Jeffries next morning, he found it amusing, Jeffries did, as if right to say, you're mine, he messed up by trying to touch you sort of thing, it's all a game to them. Harry Jeffries was one of several men using Peter Howell's casting agency as a cover to take thousands of indecent photographs of children. In the late 1980s, Peter Howells decided to leave England and open a new office in Amsterdam. One of the men who was certainly connected with this investigation was now living full-time in Amsterdam. There was an incident in respect to this man. He was assaulted. And I understand from the Dutch police that when they went to render assistance, that in fact all over the houseboat was numerous photographs of young boys in indecent poses. The difficulty is the difference in laws between our two countries and the Dutch police were unable 
to do anything about it because of their different laws. But certainly my main concern was because of the connection between all these men was that they were certainly would have been pictures of some of my victims. I'm a man in my 30s with a dark... In order to speak to Mr. Howells about his interest in young boys, we tempted him off his houseboat with an offer of work for his casting agency. A Dutch leather hat. Oh, yes. Okay. See you, Tam. Thanks. Um, we're from Granada Television. And um, we're making a documentary. Can you tell me how many children you and other men have sexually abused at the home of Harry Jeffries? None. You Harry Jeffries. Well, you and other men worked no, with me. Mr. Jeffries and have seen photographs were taken of very young children. The children and their parents were told that they could get acting work through your casting agency, Bobber Boots. Well, it's nothing to do with me. Right? Well, you've been named in statements to the police as a man who sexually abused young boys. Well, I haven't. Right, you've no sexual interest in young boys. No. You're not a pedophile. No. So when the Dutch police visited your boat and they found that the walls of the boat were lined with photographs, obscene photographs of young boys, why was that? They're not. They haven't. Well, the Dutch police have said that that's what they found. Well, you better bring the lobbyists around now, then. Well, we can do that. Huh? But what we're trying to do is get some answers to our questions. You've no sexual interest in young boys. No. In fact, Mr. Howells was convicted of indecently assaulting a nine-year-old British boy more than 25 years ago. In Amsterdam, Peter Howells was an acquaintance of a far more serious criminal, Warwick Spinks. Edward, the young gay man befriended by Spinks, remembers one evening in Amsterdam when he had dinner with Spinks and Peter Howells. On about three tables behind us, uh, there was uh, a young married couple. Uh, with a, um, an eight, nine-year-old boy, and Peter couldn't take his eyes off, off this kid. Uh, he was saying, you know, I bet that boy would be good in bed, or I bet I could teach him a few things, and uh, I bet he's got a lovely body, uh, all this sort of thing he was saying at the table. Uh, and it, it was so clear exactly what he was. You've never taken up seen photographs? No, never. Never, never, fucking never. I'm not going to hit your camera, man. Don't worry. Right. Never. Are right? you recording all this? Sir. My fucking agency has nothing to do with any fucking pedophiles. Oh, God, take your card. Where is it? I'll give it to you. Thank you. I'll be fucking... Peter Howells has no connection with child prostitution or the pornographic video business set up by Warwick Spinks. In 1995, Warwick Spinks was jailed for five years for selling a 14-year-old British boy in a Dutch brothel. There's no doubt in my mind that Warwick Spinks was offering children to men for sex. Uh, when we searched his house, we found a list uh, that he called the Clanton list, the client list, with the youngen, which is another expression for boys, with various details of them and their bodies shown on it, and also the various interests of the clients. So I've no doubt that this... Uh, this was the business operated by him. Edward claims that he only discovered the truth about the child prostitution ring run by Warwick Spinks after he'd broken away from the scene in Amsterdam. Warwick came up with the idea of having boats just outside of Amsterdam uh, where these clients could go there would be a, a young boy on the boat and there would be the client on the boat and then they would be able to do whatever they wanted to uh, to the boy. This man, Edward, insists he has seen five videotapes where children have been sexually abused, tortured, and then killed in front of a camera. The man was on board with the boy. Um, he was allowed to do anything that he wanted uh, to do to the boy. Um, things got out of hand and the boy ended up dying, uh, which was recorded on a video camera. How did the boy die? Yeah, he suffocated on the genitals of the man. And what happened after the boy had apparently suffocated? 
on the tape? What did you see on the tape? That there was panic, um, that there was a, a lot of running in and out. Um, the, the camera got hit from the side uh, and blanked out. But, but the whole thing was, an, uh, it was inevitable that this was actually going to happen. There was sound on the camera. Um, you could hear the, the, the waves slapping against the side of the boat. Uh, you, you could hear um, uh, noises of um, waterfowl in the background. You could hear um, the boy gagging. Uh, you could hear the man grunting. Um, when, when the boy actually died, you could hear um, the panic in the man's voice. Edward has no criminal record. He has not been paid for telling his story. And since talking to us, he has been interviewed by both the British and Dutch police and has offered to work with them to prove that what he says is true. The Dutch police have now launched a formal inquiry into Edward's allegations. The reason Edward has to be taken seriously is that he's pointing a finger at a man with a track record of appalling sexual violence towards young boys. Warwick Spinks was placed under surveillance by Scotland Yard precisely because of information received that he was selling tapes of children being tortured and killed. In a remarkable and revealing conversation when he did not know he was being secretly recorded by undercover police officers in Holland, Spinks boasted of his knowledge of snuff movies. An actor reads from the official police transcript. I know somebody who was in a snuff movie, and somebody got snuffed in front of him. He was from Birmingham, middle twenties. I know the person who made the film. I felt sorry for this boy. He was a German boy, about 13, 15. He thought he was going to make 200 guilders, and ended up being dead. I know I'm a fat old queen, but I get away with murder. Rumours of the existence of what are known as snuff movies have been around for a very long time. Law enforcement officers have never ever found one of these. However, it's fair to say that in my experience we've witnessed video films of horrendous abuse of children arriving at a point where uh, they are tortured. From prison, Spinks denies committing any crime. I had three brothels in Amsterdam, but that is not in itself does not make me a murderer. It does not make me an associate of murderers. It does not mean I'm in a pedophile ring, because I, I've never had anything to do with anything like that. I think Warren Springs is completely disgusting. He's put a lot of people through a lot of pain. He doesn't care about the consequences. He, he just doesn't think about that. He, he just wants the boys. He just wants the money. And if he... If he doesn't get it, he'll go out and get it, and he will go out and get it. Spinks is in prison because he sold one 14-year-old British boy into sexual slavery in this Amsterdam brothel. His victim, Gary, will never forget him. If, if I ever seen him again, it wouldn't be like I'm a little boy. He'd be completely different altogether. He's fucked up my life completely. He has a very damaged me inside, which, do you know what I mean? You can beat someone up but you can't damage him emotionally like he has done to me and a lot of other people who he's done it to. Edward insists that not only was Spinks involved in the systematic abuse of children, he was also involved in their murder. At our request, Edward has helped the Dutch police find the house in a suburb of Amsterdam where he says he was shown videos of young boys being killed. And Edward has described to the police the lake where the men he met at the house told him they had disposed of the bodies. But if Spinks and the gang are arranging for the murder of children on this kind of scale, almost a production line, surely it would have come to the attention of the authorities. The boys that they chose would have been homeless uh, and they would have been very vulnerable children. There was a boy with sallow skin and brown hair, brown eyes, uh, which is uh, unusual for, for 
Amsterdam. Um, I, I have no idea um, where they got him from. Um, but there were two blonde-haired boys and a strawberry blonde boy and uh, a boy with uh, a very distinctive haircut. It was shaved uh, over both ears uh, with uh, a loop and a, a parting down the middle. Did the boys speak on the tips? They cried and screamed. Um, uh, they did uh, cry out, but uh, I don't know what language they were crying out in. Acting on our information, the Dutch police have now taken lengthy detailed statements from Edward. The Dutch Justice Ministry has launched a full inquiry into his allegations. They already know that Warwick Spinks has a history of gross sexual violence towards young people. And they know that he has been repeatedly identified to the British police as a possible supplier of snuff movies. British Customs have confirmed to us that Edward first offered his incredible story to them in 1991. At that time, he was not believed. Given the sort of abuse the police see on tapes that they have seized, they do agree that children may have been killed for the camera. I mean, short of, 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 of actually, I would say, um, fatally uh, injuring this child um, and, and him, him dying, I don't think there's, there's anything else they can do to him. It's, it's so horrific that, um, it, it, and, and the boys, he, he obviously can point the finger at the abuser if he's, if he's eventually uh, found. Um, so. I wouldn't like to say what has happened to this boy. I find it quite frightening that, um, that, that they've done this much to him. Um, and I don't think that uh, the next step could be that, that they've killed him. Edward says that he's speaking out now because he can no longer live with his failure to act when he first saw Warwick Spinks leading off a young boy in the centre of Amsterdam. In the films that I saw, I saw five children killed. And it was organized and orchestrated by Warwick and his associates. I had no control over the boys uh, that were killed on the tapes. Um, th there was nothing I could do other than try and bring it to the attention of the authorities when I was back in England. Um, but I did see Warwick with that boy outside the Spaustrat at the Gay Palace. And I didn't do anything about it at the time. And uh, I don't know how he worked out. What do you think happened to that boy? I don't know. I think that uh, Warwick is a very evil man. And anything could have happened to that boy. I, I'm With what I know now about Warwick, I should have done more, but when you see a boy in the flesh, as opposed to seeing them on tape, it, it's, a, it's a different thing in front of me. Do you blame yourself? Yes. What do you hope will happen as a result of speaking out now? I hope that they go to jail for the rest of their lives. And I hope that... Uh, the boys who they killed, their families will know. And I hope maybe one day I'll find out what happened to the boy that Warwick was with that day.